Hello, welcome to a one hour special, I Remember When, with the Fitchburg Historical Society. Today we'll be talking about the new abolitionist park being developed in Fitchburg and about the history of abolition in Fitchburg. I'm Susan Navarre, Executive Director at the Fitchburg Historical Society, and I'm speaking with my guests, Danette Day of Fitchburg State University, uh, David Thibault Munoz of Mount Wachusett Community College, and later Keisha Tracy of Fitchburg State University will be on to talk about cultural heritage and monuments. So abolition was the movement to make slavery illegal in the United States and around the world. So it was from about 1830 to about the 1860s that it was a major political movement in Fitchburg. And the city was also central to the Union cause in the Civil War. And Fitchburg actually stayed involved with the movement to ensure the civil rights of African Americans after the Civil War, say from the 1860s up to the 1920s. Right now I'd like to talk with our guests about how this kind of history, of local history, can be part of our lives right now. Can you tell our audience uh, who you are and what you do? I'm David Thibault Munoz. I am an academic counselor and an adjunct faculty member at Mount Wachusett Community College. And uh, um, this work came out of a class that I teach, a first year experience class. And I'm Dr. Danette Day, and I am in the School of Education, an associate professor, and I teach teachers who, young people who want to be teachers, and I teach in the grad program people who are in the field and would like to become educational leaders in some way. Well, you know, when we were prepping for this show, we were talking about how the abolitionist park was a pocket park. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that was sort of a new term that I just started hearing. And so I thought I would ask what actually is a pocket park and what are the benefits of having a pocket park? So uh, a pocket park is basically when you, when you have an area of like a you know, neighborhood that's densely populated, um, uh, like the area where the park is, uh, very few people have uh, green space and yards. And so it sort of takes a, a vacant lot, which we can, we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, and then, you know, which is maybe trash filled or overgrown and turns it into something that the community can use uh, rather than, you know, staying vacant for, for years and years and years or being developed into a house. Uh, or other uh, housing dwelling. Uh, so it's sort of a new idea of realizing that there's, there's a resource there, even if it's a small space. Yes. Uh, so, and then this is Abolitionist Park. And so it, can you say what, what makes it Abolitionist Park? How is it different from any other small parks? Well, before I even talk about the land that um, this park is now on, um, I'd like to recognize that there were indigenous peoples here before, way before any of us were here. And um, there are many uh, indigenous tribes that own that land, or at least were on that land. And there, there is the Penacook, the Wabanaki, the Nipmuc, and a few others. Mm -hmm. um, so I just would like to make sure people understand that the land now that we're taking care of um, and we're stewards of at this point um, was land that indigenous people were on and now they were dispossessed of that land. So the land that is now the abolitionist park um, is owned by Fitchburg State University. It's owned mm -hmm. by the foundation. And when we were looking for a place to um, build this park, um, I kind of hung out with David and his students and we cleared a couple um, lots and um, mm -hmm none of those were viable and for different reasons. And then Fitchburg State, um, Jay Bright, Fitchburg State, was at one of our meetings and he said that there's a piece of land on Snow Street and it just so happens that Benjamin Snow is um, one of the abolitionists that we are <laughs> honoring um, with this park. So that was uh, some land that he owned at the time that he was active in Exactly. How fortuitous is That's, that? It's amazing, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then you figured out that to get started, so then what's the process of actually turning that into a public amenity? Well, um, the way that it started actually is uh, first it was me attending 
uh, an event hosted by the Hist Fitchburg Historical Society in the winter of either 2016 or 2017, mm -hmm. uh, which, if, if my memory serves me, was about Kansas and the, the movement of people from F Fitchburg to Kansas to prevent it from becoming a, uh, another slave state. Uh, and um, at that event, I was kind of just looking around, and I saw a pamphlet, uh, I think it was from the 50s, uh, called uh, A Bell for Shadrach. Mm. It was a, it actually, I think it was a, a playbill. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I started looking at it, I said, wow, this is really interesting. You know, there was really a lot of um, abolitionist activity in Fitchburg, and Fitchburg was on the map of the, you know, of the Underground Railroad. So I had decided, you know what, when I teach, the next time I teach, I'm gonna assign the narrative of Frederick Douglass, and I'm gonna have students do research on local abolitionist history. And through that, that combined with something I had started the, the summer before, because my classes were being based out of Fitchburg State and in the neighborhood, oh. uh, we started looking at, had my students sort of looking at um, the downtown area and uh, you know, looking at things like vacant lots the summer before we walked down Main Street and the students um, had said, well, there's no, there's no seating here. So we created some park benches and then the, the following summer we were looking at these vacant lots, like the ones that um, Dr. Day was talking about um, the, uh, on Wood Street and on Day Street, which happened to be the land that, um, where Benjamin Snow's home was uh, in, in the 18, uh, mid to late 1800s. Um, and so they proposed, they came up with this idea to propose to create a park uh, honoring uh, Fitchburg's role in the abolitionist and underground railroad movements. Did you have to sort of help them develop that proposal or did did it come out of you know their fresh eyes seeing the space and seeing the history or? I it? mean as, as um, Dr. Day was saying the first thing that we did was clear the lot right we cleaned mm -hmm. it up one of the lots and then <laughs> Uh, there was a there, were, there was a second lot which we cleaned the year after, um, but um, we were looking at both of them, and um, actually, um, Sam Squalia, who's on our on our board, um, also participated in the in the start of the project. She, you know, her background is in um, uh, architect architectural uh, work, yeah. and so she actually uh, met with with the students at the lots and then um, at Luck on Day Street uh, to kind of brainstorm about what a park might include, um, you know, and, and we were, you know, they were not just thinking about the abolitionist her history and, and, and highlighting that, but they were also thinking about, you know, how residents in the neighborhood could utilize mm -hmm. the space. Uh -uh. Um, and that's sort of like how, um, how it started, you know, it was like, you know, you want to create a park? Okay, I know someone who can help us design it. And she drew up some plans for the two lots. And then uh, we they had a presentation at the uh, First Church of God in Christ on Snow mm -hmm. Street. Uh, and uh, the mayor attended. Uh, uh, and then from there, it was, you know, the following semester, my students were involved again. I kind of rolled, rolled over the project every semester uh, for several semesters. Um, and one of the students one of the founding students um, presented a petition to the city council to set a law, set aside uh, 116 Day Street yeah. for the purpose of developing the park, um, and then it, it, that's that's kind of the you know the ball kept rolling from there. Yeah. And and dozens of residents also um, got involved. In oh, got involved! I am just blown away to think of all of these real world skills that they're using. So like an. A, charrette of ideas of weighing different options that's something that neighbors do in neighborhoods all the time to give public input and then presenting something to the city council like that prepping it researching it and writing it it's so amazing that they're using these real world skills like so yeah can you talk about that some of the skills that the students end up learning from doing a big project like this and and being out in the real world too you know not just talking to each other but also to to businesses in the city and the and the city leaders and things like that 
Okay. Yeah, I think you nailed it though, this idea of real world skills, contextualizing mm -hmm. learning, right? It's not, it's I relevant, see. it's made relevant for them. So the history in and of itself is an important piece, like learning history, mm -hmm. taking information, finding out if it's accurate. Right, we have a we have a subcommittee. It's a historical accuracy committee. They're going in and making sure that whatever information they find is um, is valid yeah. and reliable. Yeah. And um, I think about the community organizing piece too. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a big. We had our first board meeting, and we brought people from all over the neighborhood. Right, David, and and at that point, we started to ask people what would they like to do, what skills do they think they bring. Uh -huh. So it was. It began with the students and developing their skills, and then it moved into community members and, oh. and organizing the community. And that's how you then have the Friends of Abolitionist Park that they are exactly. community members. Yeah. I see. Yeah. It, and 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 I mean, the students. Um, you know, there were there were several several layers of you know civic engagement. Um, you know, uh, at points we we've gone. I think we've gone door knocking three times, <laughs> knocking every wow. single door yeah. in the neighborhood wow. between Blossom Street and North Street and Main and and um, and Pearl. Uh, and we cleaned up twice. Cleaned up twice. Just wow. to clean up the neighborhood up to the let neighborhood, people know right. we were serious about making an impact and supporting yeah. the neighborhood. Right? And then students spoke um, twice at the property committee me city property committee meeting, and twice at the board of park commissioners meeting got feedback from the commissioners and the counselors, went wow. back to the drawing board, wow. came mm -hmm. forward with new, new improved uh, uh, proposals for the parks. Um, you know, so they, you know, they really, I mean, over 80 students at this point have participated in the project. You know, wow, so. so that's like a whole team uh, that all are in Mm -hmm. These sort of smaller teams of their particular year were doing that. I, I wow. think what, you're, what he's describing is really this idea that um, you have to be able to reiterate and, and to have resilience and persist, right? Mm -hmm. and, and know that at some point what you may have dreamed of isn't exactly going to be the end product because mm -hmm. other people contribute ideas. And, and although they, in some ways it seemed like barriers, the end result was really a better product. Ah, Definitely. yeah, right? it's pretty, really. Yeah, that's, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's right, uh, 42 to 50 Snow Street, that's where our park is, mm -hmm. is twice the size of the <laughs> lot that we were oh looking gosh. at on Day Street. Yeah, yeah, uh, so, so that's awesome. <laughs> that's, yeah. yeah, well, and yeah, it is true that you, uh, I, I think that as when folks are in school and are younger, you have this idea that there is one answer. You know, you learn two plus two equals four. And so to get into aspects of the world where, or I, uh, projects and, mm -hmm. and uh, processes where there are many possible answers that you're, that you're balancing, that's a, a really different kind of learning and kind of experience and practice. Right, and you're talk what you're describing is, um, you know, that idea of diversity of perspectives and mm. this sense that that creates um, innovation, it creates the ability to, to people, for people to have to work a little harder to understand somebody's perspective so that they can at least uh. integrate part of it maybe or, or even just consider it. Yeah. Um, and it, so that it makes you a stronger thinker it, and it probably gives you more options if you're trying to problem solve you get more options to consider in a you know solving problems, making decisions. Well, is the process yeah. a little bit slower, perhaps? But yeah. in the end, you know, everybody is strengthened by it. Um, yeah. When the, I th yeah, when ahead. I think of it, how much I you know we have to use that. I'm running an exactly. organ a small organization. Oh, yeah. We sit down and meet with our board mm -hmm. or with other volunteers that help us, and so you know you have to listen to what other people's ideas are what their observations are as much as mm -hmm. you sort of can resist that you keep practicing how to how to learn and listen yeah. I wanted to add I mean yeah. the, the additional skills that students are getting is that I mean in addition to the civic engagement piece and the research uh, action research piece um, they're also participating within our board and our committees mm. uh, and some students you know they're we do it as part of the class. They get to choose a group because there's, there's multiple uh, projects um, in the class uh, that students have to choose from based based on their interest and their skill set mm -hmm. uh, and skills that they want to develop. Um, and then um, 
the students who do choose to be a part of the Fitchburg Abolitionist Project come on uh, the board uh, during the semester and some students stay on the board. Ah. They, they decide, I really want to do this. Uh, we have uh, two, two, two students who have, uh, Christina, who's, you know, who uh, was one of, I think the second, she was, she was the second summer, uh, has been on since 2018. Wow. Uh, well, she was involved in 2018. She's been on a little bit. Uh, That's Christina left Sanborn. Sanborn. Uh, yeah. And then Tristan uh, was, I think, two or three semesters ago, mm -hmm. and he's continued to be on. And then we have two wow. new students this semester, and we've had students who are on and then left or uh, yeah. moved on. But I think in the end, I mean, the students are gaining so much, uh, so many skills uh, that are transferable. And I think for young people, because the most of the students that I work with are high school dual enrollment students. Oh. They're still trying to figure out, you know, what they want to do in life. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, being able to say I like doing that or I don't is a is a good thing for them to uh, have uh, experienced um, uh, as well. Yeah. So tr uh, Tristan Sosi is the oh. y other young man, and and David neglected to say that his daughter is also on the board this semester, which oh. is very oh, my nice. daughter, right? Yes, oh, so, okay. which is lovely. Yeah. Not Tristan, yeah. say <laughs> No, no, okay. his, his <laughs> daughter is also a part of our board, so. That's In fact, actually, uh, my daughter and the other student, uh, one of the others, actually, this, there's five students. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other students are are now on our executive committee. They're, mm -hmm. they're the co co-clerk so they took the notes at our last board meeting that's, yeah. Yeah. that's actually one of the things that I've found works really well for for someone who's on a board for the first time mm -hmm. is being a clerk where you have a specific responsibility so you know that you're doing what you should be doing because it's it's specific it's just wonderful I know that a lot of nonprofits struggle to bring younger people onto their boards or into their volunteer le leadership mm -hmm. but you do it by doing it. <laughs> that's what, that's and right. you're helping them learn how to do that. Experiential that's learning. That's yeah. it. That's what yeah. it's called. So I was wondering, uh, Danette, you teach yeah. educators. I do at Fitchburg State, mm -hmm. and so, do you think that this sort of approach, community connection, is something that they end up bringing to t being teachers too? Currently, I haven't had the chance yet to bring my students to the park. My education students. Uh -huh. I have brought my honors current event service learning students last uh -huh. semester. They loved it. Um, just to take a walk um, through what sometimes they consider a neighborhood that's a little bit off limits to them. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not, some of it is their perception of what, sure. you know, what would be a safe space or you know, how far am I willing to even walk from my dorm? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes they don't even want to walk to the rec center, and the rec center often <laughs> offers them pretty cool things. Yeah. So sometimes, it's like city. It's yeah, they steep. might go to they might go to like the Dunkin' Donuts, but you know, to go two blocks over. So when they did, when we took the walk, they were really excited about it, and that class in particular helped um, a little bit to get the word out for our Juneteenth event. Uh, um, last semester, but I, this semester I plan. Last semester I was on sabbatical, and now I plan to really bring my students, mm -hmm. um, my education students. I'm teaching a cultural competency course, and in that course, mm -hmm. we talk a lot about who they are, where they're from, what their culture is, and um, in this way, I really want them to begin to think about. They can't teach something they don't know, yeah. but they can begin to realize that there is a there are a lot of resources in the community, in the communities that they might end up working in, and if they just begin to ask those questions of people who are local, parents, um, you know, librarians, people who are a part of boards in the community, um, whoever is working in that community, you know, sometimes you don't you end up working in a school district and you don't even live in the town uh -huh. that you work in. And so you come and go and come and go. But the idea is to really have them realize that outside of their classroom, there are a lot of resources. And um, the more they can get engaged, the more they can, in, you know, really, I don't know, I think it's a matter of the resources they have to have a really engaging curriculum. Uh -huh. 
And that's one of the things is just to continue to grow your curriculum and build it so that you're, you know, you can inspire students to learn. Yeah. And that seems that that is a big improvement mm -hmm. that's happening. I know so many people who do history or public history now who remember not liking history class. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is that things that they're starting to introduce earlier now, like primary sources exactly. and al alternative viewpoints mm -hmm. and seeing it as something of a, of a um, mystery to be solved, is it's getting introduced in the K to 12 curriculum. And for a lot of us who are older, it wasn't until college or graduate school that we started to understand those aspects of history. And that's what we really liked. Right. So um, I wanted to just add add to that just a, a few a few things I think um, history I think when when you when you can connect history to local history I think it's going to be a, it, it'll uh, go a lot further with young people I feel like you know if you if, if for me I can speak for myself grew up in Fitchburg didn't know anything about Fitchburg history um, yeah. uh, I, I mean i became interested in history when I was able to learn about things I was interested in yes. in history. Um, and I think, you know, uh, when I talk to young people about what they're learning in their history class for the students who don't like it, they, they'll say something like, well, it's all about wars and U.S. presidents. And I feel like, you know, that's what we see. I mean, in, even in the city, um, you know, in most towns, the only monuments or, you know, to anything are monuments to war. And yeah. uh, you know uh, we have a different form of patriotism in this country, and that's uh, you know being in the greatest democracy in the world, and that is the that people can stand up and ha and use their voice in the face of injustice. And I think that's one of the real the reasons we wanted to, to, to you know to, a lot of the people who are involved in this park project yeah. want to do it because we're highlighting a part in history that's not always celebrated and highlighted. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that you know, you know, you know, with regard to teachers, um, you know, and, and teacher training, is that we, you know, we need to, we need to have some homegrown teachers that are, you know, a direct pipeline from, you know, Monty Tech and Fitchburg High School and Sizer into Fitchburg State and then back into our public yeah. school system, yeah. uh, you know, and the, I think the way to do that, you know. It, you know, maybe we don't pay as much as you know, Worcester, or Boston, or wherever people are going to teach. Uh, but you know, if people feel connected to the city, uh, in the way I eventually did as as a doll, I moved away. I wanted to come back. You know, that's that's what we 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 want people to want to stay, uh, not not uh, leave town when they get their degree. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, that's all. Yeah, I think that's that's really important. It's interesting at the historical society, we end up seeing a lot of people who, for for one reason or another in their career, moved away, and then as soon as they can when they're retiring, they come back to Fitchburg and they come through our doors because they want to connect with Fitchburg again in a really deep way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true that I, d I don't know as much about kids. I don't see them as an educator the way you guys do. But I know even for myself, I love being able to walk around and see a place and say, this happened there and this family lived here. And you know, it have that kind of depth in, in what you see. And I think we'll be talking about uh, in the second half about um, some of the upcoming programs around Abolition Park, but I think uh, local walking tours make provide that opportunity for people. And and you know this history can be taught in a way that um, looks at some of the despair and some of the you know the troubling parts of this history is is man's inhu inhumanity right to other men or you know, people weren't treated well. Yeah. And so, but the idea is not to continue to talk about the hardship and the, right. and the, you know, in some ways I see it as really, really evil in a lot of ways, and we really get down to it. But we really want people to talk about the idea that people needed freedom and they yeah. were, you know, they were 
resisting. They were ingenious. They were courageous. All these things. And even the yeah. allyship, like the fact that people came together to do this work. And um, and thank goodness. And, yeah. and, and we yeah. can continue That's to do great. that because we still have trying times right now. Yeah. There's a lot of trouble. And there's happening. still a lot to be discovered, yeah. too, in, in our... Uh, in our collections, it's sort of hidden away because these things were illegal at the time that they happened. Sure. But well, so we'll return to talk about this a little bit more. Okay. We're going to have Keisha Tracy on with us next, and then we'll come back and talk about the future of Abolitionist Park. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to I Remember When with the Fitchburg Historical Society. I'm Susan Navarre, Executive Director, and we're talking about the history of abolition in Fitchburg and the new abolitionist park that's been developed. My guest now is Professor Keisha Tracy. And can you tell us who you are and what you do? Sure, uh, I am an Associate Professor of English Studies at Fitchburg State University. Uh, I'm also currently the chair of the general education program area at the university too, so these things kind of play together and I probably mention general education on a regular basis. Uh, but I am actually, um, my main focus is medieval studies, uh, but I always generally say pretty much everything before Shakespeare. I, I teach in the department at some point in time, so everything <laughs> before that's in my, in my purview. <laughs> For many of us, medieval studies, it's a little intimidating, you know, it was a challenging period to learn about and so just setting it up that way we say okay it's really the olden it <laughs> is and I yeah and it's my job to make it so that it's not so complicated I see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well I, I know that you've talked uh, that you're working on a project about something that you call cultural heritage and I remember when I first started to learn about the project I was I thought, well, I know what history is, I think, because I studied history classes and I took some literature classes, but I wasn't sure what cultural heritage means. Is it different from history? Does it overlap with history? It definitely overlaps. Uh, cultural heritage includes all of those you've mentioned, including arts and science and philosophy, really all of the subjects kind of play into cultural heritage. Uh, one way to kind of look at it is that cultural heritage is really about uh, the appreciation of the cultural, uh -huh. the heritage that we're talking about uh, in this respect. So it's um, th one of the principles of cultural heritage, for example, is, uh, is about the idea that it, it combines the enjoyment and pleasure that is involved in, the, in, in heritage um, with the oh. idea of appreciation of that, with the idea that if you appreciate, then you want to learn more about mm -hmm. that, and then if you want to learn, and once you've learned more, you're more likely to want to preserve it, uh, and then the cycle begins again. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a, it's this idea that it, it brings in all of these fields, and it really does talk about all of those things. But it, it really is about how we interact with it, how we, mm -hmm. how we appreciate it, how we experience it. Um, it's oh. also about you know the kinds of heritage that are negative, that have that cause negative feelings, or um, have negative co connotations for certain peoples. So it encompasses all of that. But it, it, I use it a lot in my classes because uh, I find I like to in my classes I like to get into why we're doing what we're doing. Right. Um, it's one of my one of my favorite things to do at the beginning of the semesters. And one of the things that I use is cultural heritage as a way to kind of show the significance of what it is that mm. we're doing and kind of that long, uh, the long view uh, and how it can be a personal relationship uh, to the past heritage, even if it's not your heritage. There can be, um, there can be commonalities that people have uh, that you can appreciate, even if it's you know, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, uh, that humans are humans and that we yeah. have, uh, you know, have that sort of background uh, and so the connections can be made. Well, and so, like, I've, I've known people who, as soon as they start learning about, say, Chinese culture, they just get fascinated right. with it and keep starting. So that's yeah, the kind of thing? Yeah, there's, there's something about that with cultural heritage, um, where the idea that once you get into it and you really see the uniqueness or you really see something about it, or you go down the rabbit hole and start researching, <laughs> or, or whatever might happen, that, that that a deeper appreciation occurs, and then you know you, then comes more education, comes um, 
preservation comes all the things that come after it because you have an interest in what it is that you're doing or you find a connection to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you know, once you get into a subject, that's, that's a very similar type of situation where you get into it and you find something that speaks to you. Uh, and cultural heritage and, and learning things from a cultural and looking at it from that lens can, can mm -hmm. really give that kind of view. I see. And so we're, we're talking today about Abolitionist Park in Fitchburg. And so I think I'm getting some ideas of how that is part of our cultural heritage. That it's, so on one hand, it's a green space that you go to and you can relax and enjoy that. But it's also uh, helping us understand our own history. Is mm, that? Absolutely. Uh, and I think this is an amazing project. Uh, when I first heard about it from Dr. Day, I was really excited. Uh, the, the idea of this, of this pocket park uh, really does kind of encapsulate all I was talking about with, with cultural mm -hmm. heritage because it's a space to enjoy and, and I loved how Dr. Day was talking about taking her students there and you know, them, them really liking the fact of going to this space. Uh, but also, you know, it is a place to learn at the same time. It is a place to understand the people that came before in Fitchburg uh. Uh, and it is a place to appreciate what they did uh, at that same time and then perhaps come away with uh, a feeling of, do, of wanting to do something yourself, whether mm. that may be cleaning up a park, um, whether that may be contributing to, to um, memorializing these people who did certain things, or maybe it's getting into to, um, human rights uh, in this mm -hmm. particular case. So uh, it's, it really is a great example of, of the kind of the cycle that I'm talking about with cultural heritage, because it's sort of, it's all of that at the same time. Mm -hmm. You're enjoying, appreciating, learning, and then perhaps, and also experiencing mm -hmm. preservation at the same time. I loved to read and it was all, all this knowledge came out of books and it seems that we're now bringing our knowledge and the history out into the world a little bit more so that it's something that we're all sharing together. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I, uh, one of the, the things about the you know, new technologies and, and digitization uh, and all of those sorts of things is that there's more access for people to mm. be able to experience something. Uh, that either is down the road or is across the world. Uh, and so there is this ability to be able to experience it. Uh, and so there's, there's, there's this desire to sort of go outward with things. Uh, and I also in, in you know, just in uh, the university setting, we are really, f not just here at Fitchburg State, but in, in academics in general, we're focusing a lot on public humanities and public scholarship, um, mm -hmm. which is this idea of taking what we do and the knowledge that we have and being able to communicate it, which for a long time we really weren't doing um, yeah. very well. And so it's, it's becoming more uh, important, I think, or at least we're recognizing the importance mm -hmm. uh, that we need to, you know, we need to communicate what it is that we're finding. It's, uh, and and what, we're, what we understand and what kind of knowledge we're building and uh, and what kind of what we're figuring out about human nature as a result of all mm -hmm. you know of, of cultural heritage. Uh, so yeah, it, the, the, it's really it's awesome to see. Uh, <laughs> I like to get my students involved in it as much yeah. as possible because I want them to understand that what they're doing is not not just located to you know the classroom walls, uh, and just like uh, Dr. Day is doing with her students, so getting them out into the community. Uh, so yeah, it, I think it, it's really important that um, we continue this trend. I see. Where we're starting, and you know, the historical society, historical societies in general, have been have been helping with this trend for quite a while. Uh, so yeah, it's it's great to see that we're starting to communicate it a lot more. It, it's so funny because when I first read about this, um, it was mostly uh, the idea that you would have kids in classes write for other kids because then they would, it would be real for them. Right. That somebody else, one of their peers was reading it. But this is really this taking is this step. a lot further. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a much further step. Uh, and it's a great, if that's what, you know, the, the, what's, what you're capable of doing in the classroom, providing audiences within your classroom. Mm. But to be able to provide a, a community audience uh, to be able and to be able to bring the community in to what the university is doing uh, and what yeah. universities are doing is very important. Uh, sometimes those things get siloed and we don't really see yeah. the connections that exist. So it goes both ways, you know, to, to, to be able to show students that what they're learning has purpose, <laughs> right? Has significance. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching a course now on writing too that we have a cultural heritage project that we work on every mm -hmm. semester. And, and one that I'm trying to teach them that through writing, they can communicate about what it is that oh. they want to communicate about cultural heritage, the pieces that they've chosen. 
so yeah, I mean, we can use our skills to be able to do that. I am just realizing that I've had conversations with uh, other archivists in the in the area here in Fitchburg specifically where we say how is it that this city has accomplished so many extraordinary things over its over its history and because while being a smaller city it's st it's still created so much innovation in manufacturing but also in learning and writing and so many different fields medicine and everything yeah. and we i it seems that the university being a part of the community and bringing the knowledge that they're developing or you know so the the history of them having the mckay school and teaching teachers how to teach, but also the kids being able to benefit immediately from these enthusiastic, skilled teachers. Absolutely, and part of it, and this goes along with you know the, the, the aspect of cultural heritage being so interdisciplinary, and in mm -hmm. particular, the example of the abolitionist park, you know, there's there's one thing about learning about something, which is fantastic, and, and I encourage everybody to do that <laughs> in whatever way that they can, but there's also ways to go about that. Like our historians have been taught how to look at primary documents, how to study certain things in particular kinds of ways. As a literature and professor, I'm trained to, to be able to do things in certain ways. Yeah. And so to bring that to the table as well, not only the interest in it, but to bring how to do that and the, the discipline that you know that people have learned and the and the um, the way that we go about doing things I think is is really a, a great combination of a, of a mm -hmm. university and a community is to be able to take the interest that people have and I, I follow the Fitchburg Historical Society Facebook page and so I know how excited people are about a lot of things yeah. uh, but then to be able to say bring a, a literature expert or bring an historian and or an art historian and say okay this is what I see and this is what I know based you know this is what I can bring to this based upon my experience with other things it's a great combination that it really is. I've seen that sometimes the people who are coming from another field and they're an amateur wanting to learn more history, they're just hungry for those skills so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel, so right. that they can figure out how, how to do that. So I'm wondering with, with monuments and memorials like I get, we're using the uh, the park as an example, but actually, I'd love to hear about other examples from around the world. Are do they have a different meaning for the individuals who create them, and then for the people who go to it, and for the community? And yeah, there's so many perspectives that get tied up into monuments. They seem so simple. Like you yeah. see, you know, you see a, a chunk of whatever metal or, or something, a stone, <laughs> and and you think that that's you know you understand. But there's so much that goes into it, and there's so much emotion that can go into it. Um, just some examples that I can can think of. Um, I was uh, after the the um, Boston Marathon bombings. Uh, there were a lot of memorials that went up in mm -hmm. Boston, and. Th for people who were in that, experienced that bombing, those have very powerful <laughs> effects upon them, right? Going yeah. to those monuments, seeing the what, you know, seeing the, the memorial that people have put up to the experiences of the people that were there. If you were there, that has a very different resonance than it does if say, you know, you're, you're a, a tourist or a visitor right. from outside. It has a very different resonance. Uh, and so there's, there's different, perspectives that, that that exist as a part of it, right? So I, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of um, in the 13th century in England, there were uh, put up a, a series of Eleanor crosses and um, Edward, King Edward the oh. first, uh, his wife, Eleanor of Castile, she, she passed away uh, and the, the path that her body took from where she died oh. back to London, he had erected a uh, a whole series of these monuments to her along that path. And there are many of them still exist today. Uh, some of them bigger and more famous than others, but the, <laughs> they're, they're all still there. And, and you know, we can look at those and we can appreciate them as art. We can appreciate them as sculpture. Um, and perhaps then we can get into the emotion that goes behind this. I mean, we, you know, he, he loved his wife. We, we have pretty good evidence that they had a very you know, good relationship and that he really did care very, very, very much about his wife, which is contrary to a lot of popular belief about kings. Uh, right. But he erected those out of, you know, out of um, concern and care for her. Uh, and then the people also seem to really you know, 
care for her as well. There were memorial services at each of the, the monuments that continued for several years afterwards. Uh, and you know pageants and and, and uh, parades that would happen along those lines I, I, with respect to that. So every everything's kind of different, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know his. You know, if you think back, like what was his King Edward's thoughts about doing this for his wife, right? Was um, the people who were looking at it, who ha lived under her reign, what were they thinking about yeah. it? Uh, people who visited from other places during the time period, and now us looking at it from all this time away. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you can. It, it's a monument to grief. I mean, yeah. it's, 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 it's one wow. of those types of things. And then you can get into, you know, monuments that have negative connotations uh, and that, you know, cause very powerful feelings in people. I'm thinking uh, in 2020, during the Black Lives Matter protests, the one of the, the Christopher Columbus statue in Boston, yes. the head was taken off during during one of the protests. And you think about that, right? Like, why, why, what is the meaning of, of doing that to a statue? Well, the mm -hmm. statue, you know, Christopher Columbus, the statue ha represents some very terrible things, you know, indigenous issues, some that were already spoken about, uh, that it has connotations and it has repercussions today. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that it caused so much emotion yeah. that somebody needed to do that to get that emotion out is, it says a lot about this particular thing. It's not, I'm common to have that sort of thing happen to monuments. I mean, we have examples, uh, ancient Egypt, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the Pharaoh Akhenaten uh, wanted to take a polytheistic society and make it monotheistic and only worship the sun god. Uh, and after he, his death, um, they went back to a polytheistic society and they, they almost like they tried to erase him. And so yeah. we have like an example of a head of, Ak of a statue of Akhenaten and that we know was teared off, torn off of the original mm -hmm. statue because that, that, that was the feeling, right? Uh, and we have you know, plenty of examples today with um, Confederate monuments uh, and that sort of thing. So monuments can cause a lot of emotion and, and depending on your uh, interaction with it, depending on the kinds of feelings that it actually creates yeah. and, and whether you're a, a marginalized person or not, that, that the, the, you know, the dominant society has created this monument, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that can go into it, but you can have a personal emotion that, that is attached very clearly to it. I mean, the, I was reading actually something about from, I think it's the grandson of, um, Robert E. Lee about the, oh, yeah. the taking down of the Robert E. Lee, and he's all for it, by the mm -hmm. way. He, he thinks it's, it's the correct thing to do is to take them down. Uh, but I'm thinking, you know, he has a different, I mean, this is his family we're talking about, you know, that's yeah. not just some, you know, general that we heard read about in our history books. This is a family member. Uh, and so it's, it changes depending on what your, what your connection to it is. So, so if somebody is talking about it with somebody else, or I think I've been reading that about the ideas on some of these really controversial, these monuments that uh, that bring up, you know, feelings of great pain uh, for a lot of the people in the in the society. There's an idea of well, maybe you put them in a museum, or maybe you put another sign yeah. next to them that it explains what they were. D does that work? Does that? It's complex, right? I mean, it's a very complex subject. Um, some people get very emotional about taking down monuments. Uh, so there's, there's, there's that side of that, of, of should we be taking them down if they've been put up for a reason? Of course, you have to look into the reasons they were originally put up in the first place. Uh, most Civil War monuments were put up during the Civil Rights Movement to counter the Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so there's, there's that to consider, you know, to know your history about why this monument is there. Um, there's also the idea that just get rid of them, right? Just, just, just melt them down and mm -hmm. get rid of them. Uh, I, there's, there's the idea of putting them into a museum and, it, and at least interpreting them in some fashion. I have to admit that's usually my favorite uh, choice simply because I, I, I like the idea of education and interpretation and I think mm -hmm. that's a moment to, to do that type of interpretation. There's uh, also the, I believe, uh, I wanna say, I can't remember the city, but they they were melting down the statues, and then um, black artists were going to use them to recreate, oh. right? And so that's a very interesting concept. You're taking one heritage and you are recreating into another type of cultural heritage. And so the story, the history of what that underlay the original monument, the fact that the original yeah. one was 
an attack on the civil rights movement stays at some level that you know about that, right. but it gets transformed into something else. That's yeah, really which I find very exciting as well. That's um, interesting. So that's probably yeah. becoming my favorite way to do it. It's a fairly <laughs> new thing, so it's becoming my favorite. But I mean, you know, it, it really does depend on a lot of things. I mean, I, I, I've told my students that after the Christopher Columbus statue in Boston, I said I really wanted it to stay up without the head. Well, that's one of the, that's the great things about cultural heritage. It, it's fluid. Like, it just ke keeps moving and keeps going. Uh, I'm thinking it, in terms of the abolitionist park, you know, you have abolitionists <laughs> who were working and, and had certain, you know, those beliefs, right, at this particular point in time. And now we're continuing that thought process by, by putting this memorial mm. up. But how, and now we're having to think, well, what does that mean in our own time in period, time. right? So how does that change? So uh, the, it's always fluid in, in how we feel about it, depending on our time. Uh, the Christopher Columbus statue was, was quite well beloved by the Italian community in Boston because it, Italian, the Italian community was also marginalized at one point in time. So sure. putting up that monument was, you know, uh, was, was, was uh, very special to them. So, you know, there's a, it's, it's always fluid in how, how the, the heritage is represented. Wow. Thank you so much Thank for you speaking much for to this me. today. <laughs>
a couple that are there every single day. And I was there doing something, and they heard me speaking to somebody else. And they walked all the way down the sidewalk to say hello to me because they, they knew my voice. And I mean, I've learned so many wow. stories about people's lives that are living in the neighborhood. And every time they go by it, they, they commend us on how beautiful it is. And we say to them, it's your park. You know, mm -hmm. use it, come. And, and some of them are really doing that now. So I, on a TV show you were on, Danette, um, you mentioned that you were a civics teacher. And so I, I wonder, is a place like this, you know, having a place of celebration like this sort of a part of our role as citizens? I can't imagine you living in a community and not wanting to know who your neighbors are. and. Mm -hmm. And those are your current neighbors, but also what is the history of that space and that place? Um, and especially as someone who is an educator, and I'm going to have students being in classrooms where children live in neighborhoods that you know they are teaching the children, and they go back to their homes, and they go back to their neighborhoods. And this idea of wanting to know who they are, wanting to know their current stories, but also spreading the word of the history that is a part of the area that they now reside in is yeah. so important because it gives people identity, it gives people connection, it gives them pride, a yeah. self um, confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I find that if you don't know it, it's okay if you don't know it. This is what I say to my young teachers. Sure. However, it's up to you as an educated being to begin to learn about it. And so I do a lot of work on saying to them you know, you are where you are now with your understanding of whatever it is you're going to teach, whatever history. Um, but it's, it, if you're going to be educated, you have to then do some of the work. And, mm. and I bring resources to them. I provide opportunities for them to work with each other on projects. So yes, and, and now my service learning community, that group that I'm trying to create a community of learners, they're undergraduates. And we're now looking at Fitchburg and looking at a variety of um, opportunities through New View has done a lot of work mm -hmm. with the stewards programs. Yeah. And a lot of our students are going to be um, involved with the environmental stewards and, um, and looking at the voters, um, the fair share amendment, the voters table. Uh, so I'm bringing people in. There's another group called Seeks Co. And it's all about the businesses in the, in, in the neighborhood. And so there's a lot of opportunity to become civically engaged, yes. I'm just blown away to hear about all of this because I feel that even in the last 10 years or something that these, so many of these initiatives mm -hmm. are newly being created. And mm -hmm. I want to say that um, <clears throat> maybe, also maybe three years ago, I went to a statewide get together that the Mass Cultural Council put together. And of course, a lot of us that get funding f or try to get funding from the Massachusetts Cultural Council <laughs> go to that to try to schmooze them up. And, uh, <laughs> and the folks there from at the state level said, you know, when I said that I was from Fitchburg and the Historical Society, they said, wow, Fitchburg's really well represented. You guys are really doing a lot. And you're real organized. And, and they've so they were struck by it then, and other uh, statewide groups have said that they notice that the different, I guess you say, activists mm -hmm. and the different institutions in Fitchburg talk to each other a lot. And I think that's a really exciting thing that, mm -hmm. you know, I was saying uh, in our break here that I was, I was saying to David that I loved seeing all of our guests chatting together. And it's because we're so excited to be able to see each other again and, mm -hmm. and talk with each other. It's really, it's really something else. And we've else. created a niche that is actually then being recognized, like you said, outside of um, North Central Mass, right, uh, at the state yeah, level, which yeah. is great. So that's really yeah. exciting. And, and I was wondering whether your own ideas on abolition or enslavement or your knowledge about it or even your thinking about it has changed in the last few years as you've been working on this project. Were there any surprises for you too? That's another way of thinking of it. I mentioned earlier, you know, that that you know, I, I kind of heard rumblings of William Lloyd Garrison having a connection to to Fitchburg, but I had no idea, just like I, I think most people, that there was this really active abolitionist 
ag activism happening in, in, in Fitchburg, first in the 1830s, mostly led by women, uh, which um, wow. in that time period, I mean, it, it wasn't appropriate for women to speak in public meetings, right? Mm -hmm. but, but here are women kind of taking the reins uh, of, of, of the movement and really launching it in this area, uh, Francis Drake and, and Lamester as well. Uh, and the other uh, thing is that, you know, Benjamin Snow Jr., who lived on Day Street, was the vice president of the American Anti-Slavery Society. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and that meant that he had connections with Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison and Harriet Beecher Stowe and Henry David Thoreau and um, the Grimke, Grimke the Grimke sisters, 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 Grimke sisters yeah. Yeah. Uh, and all of these abolitionists Lucy that are you know, Lucy Stone that are yep. on uh, the na of national national stature, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely, um, yeah. And the it just leaders. meant that the Fitchburg, at one time, you know, and uh, was it a very important place to to come to uh, to connect with people who, uh, you know, uh, would would help to provide resources for the movement, uh, including their voices. And I think that's, I, I feel like that's the thing that, you know, we, we, need to, we need to know that there's a connection. We need to know that Frederick Douglass stayed at Benjamin Snow's house on occasion yeah. and spoke yeah. at the Trinitarian Congregational Church, which was founded for the purpose of uh, creating Policy. a chapter of the, uh, of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Uh, and when when slavery was abolished, it wasn't long after that that the that the the church disbanded. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. because you know, so Same. it's it's uh, it's it's such a rich history and and so important um, uh, to know that you know people who lived here, you know, participated in that. Yeah, yeah, and the energy <coughs> should be able to be brought forth, right? Mm -hmm. Those beliefs. Um, you know, the idea that social justice was really important and, and now this present day movement that young people find themselves in, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement or Me Too movement, just to have them understand that, that um, you know, that work, even though some society, some aspects of it no longer needed to continue, the work does continue mm -hmm. and it just changes the members and, and maybe the focus, their vision and mission specifically might change but the idea is freedom and and you know justice uh, for all Americans movements today might be seen as as extreme right they say all oh, these these <laughs> people are always being disruptive and they're extreme but this is a this is a legacy of our democracy and we don't look back at abolitionists mm -hmm. and see them as you know as you know the way that people might see you know movements today or the you know in the 60s the movements of the 1960s but the you know you mentioned the uh, Republican Party being involved in the abolitionist movement, but the abolitionists were sort of a extreme extremist group within the Republican yes, Party. Yes. They were not they were not the mainstream. The uh, I mean, they really pushed. They had to push the Republican Party, um, including abolition. Frederick Douglass, um, toward abolition um, because you know because they were. I mean, and that's that's something that I feel like we need to celebrate and not shun. You know, I feel like generation after generation after generation sees young people who are taking taking the reins and uh, you know and fighting, continuing that that fight for uh, uh, social justice. Um, uh, and it's always seen as sort of like you know, <laughs> you know, everyone wants to you know back away from it <laughs> right. but the reality is that we wouldn't have come as far as we have as a society without it. Oh, thank you so much thank for you. being here this evening. I'll mention that this show is partly sponsored by uh, the Mass Humanities under their bridge sponsorships and actually the original creation of I Remember When was also sponsored or uh, underwritten by the National Endowment for the Humanities. So Fitchburg is reaching out to the to the whole world with our programs. So, and thank you most of all to Fitchburg Access TV uh, and for all of the members and donors to the Fitchburg Historical Society. Thank you, good night. <laughs>